What a beautiful September morning it is. And it's good to be gathered, and I welcome you to this community of faith as we gather to worship God and to be nurtured in deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. Welcome to those of you who are gathered here this morning in Lionsbrook Community Hall, which is the home of Lionsbrook United Church, and a warm welcome as well to those of you who may join with us in worship from your home by means of our online service. Today, I also celebrate that Sunday School is resuming for the Scottsburg Lionsbrook congregations, and we welcome back children who are here today and look forward to others who will be joining us as the month goes on. So good to see you folks too. I'm the Reverend Jim Weber Cook, and I'm in ministry with the people of Salt Springs, Scottsboro, and Lionsbrook, Pastoral Church of the United Church of Canada. And today, just to acknowledge those taking part, I am joined in leadership by our organist, Stuart Monroe, who's back from holidays. Yay! <laughs> and I uh, also am grateful to Grace McGinnis, who will light our Christ candle. Lay reader is Debbie Crossman. Mission, Minute for Mission presenter will be Florence Sutherland. Our videographer is Christine McKenzie. And the members of the Scottsburg Lionsbrook United Church Choir offer a ministry of music. And leadership is also being provided today by Eva and Beth and Dehanna as they go down with the children who are here to lead in our Sunday school. Thanks to all these folk for their gifts of faith today. You will note that today's worship bulletin is dedicated in loving memory of Edison Murdoch Sutherland, whose birth took place May 30th, 1908, and who died on September the 3rd, 1974, which is 50 years ago this month, remembered by Sunday. Today is Food Bank Sunday, and third <coughs> Sunday of the month is our regular routine, and along with our offerings to support the work of our church, um, we bring gifts of food as we're able to support the outreach of the Picto West Bank. I want to just highlight quickly what's happening this week. You can read about it, but sometimes it sticks in your mind if you hear about it. On Tuesday evening, our official board of the Pastoral Charge meets at 7 o'clock in Salt Springs at St. Luke's. And Tuesday is also the deadline to order your soup for the upcoming soup fundraiser for this congregation. For Lions Brook, so uh, keep that in mind. On Wednesday, the Scottsburg Board of Managers meet in the hall at 7 o'clock. On Thursday, the profile team meets here at 6.15, and the stewards at Salt Springs, although you don't need to know that, but they meet that same night at 7.30, and that means every night there's something going on. We're an active community of faith. I remind you that this coming Saturday, there's a celebration of life for the late Keith McKay. It's at the uh, West River Fire Hall from 2 until 4.30 with a program of remembrance at 2.30. And next Sunday, we'll gather for worship in our usual times and places, St. Luke's at 9.15 and here at Lions Brook at 11 o'clock. And next week as well, we resume our ministry to the residents of the nursing homes in Pinto. Next Sunday, we gather at 2 o'clock at the Maritime Oddfellows Nursing Home. And St. Luke's takes the lead, but any of you are welcome to join us. I remind us as we come together that the land on which we live and worship, work, and play is Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral lands and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. As we come together today, let us reaffirm our hope that we can live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with our indigenous neighbors. Grace, come and light your candle for us to begin worship. As we are able, let's rise to sing our intro. Jesus of Nazareth. 
We have been touched by his love and his vision of what this world could be, what God intends it to be. We have been encouraged by Christ's Spirit and inspired by his living presence which is within us. We are a community of his followers seeking to continue learning and growing in faith. So come into this time of worship with your convictions and your questions, with your hopes and your needs. As those who are named Christians, we offer our gratitude and praise to God, seeking to follow Jesus' teaching and honor God. Ferris, Lord Jesus, our hymn is number 341 in Voices United. as we sing.
would like to come up a little closer so we can have a little talk together. Maybe Nanny could come too. Would that be okay? I'd like to meet you again. <laughs> Even if it just comes to the grace, that would be great. It's so good to see you again. I remember you were here before. What's your name? Luna. Luna, right. And? Octavia. Octavia. Luna and Octavia. I'm Jim. I don't know if you remember my name. And this is Grace. And I'm so glad you're here today, and we're so glad the Sunday School is starting again today for all the children, and I heard from some other families who couldn't be here today, but will be here next week and in the week's end. So welcome, Luna, Octavia, Grace. I'm trying to think, what could we do today on the first day of Sunday School? I thought, how about we play a game? You like to play games? <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't make you play Octavia. <laughs> but... I have a little game. It's an easy game. You don't have to move. It's called um, Who Am I? You know that game? Who Am I? is a game where I'm going to give you hints. I'm going to give you some clues. And you kind of act like a detective and try to figure out who I'm talking about. And we'll see how many clues it takes you to figure it out. You want to play? I feel like cash cat or something. <laughs> you want to play? Okay. We've already got your names. So, who am I? I am good at engineering and building things. I wear overalls. I have three fingers on each hand. Just shut it up when you know. I wear goggles. Okay, this one might give it to you. I like to eat bananas. I am yellow. Anybody? Minions. Yeah! <laughs> minions! Do you know Minions? Do you know the Despicable Me movie? <laughs> and do you know any of the names of the Minions? There's Dave. Bob. Yes, Bob. You're right. Yep. Yeah. So, the prize goes to, oh yeah, there are no prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Jeffrey. Okay, want to play again? Okay, who am I? The first time people met me was May 1st, 1999. I work at a fast food restaurant. I love the ocean. I have a pet snail. I laugh a lot. One of my friends is a squirrel named Sandy. Okay. Ah, oh, you got it! <laughs> and the last clue was, I live in a pineapple under the sea. <laughs> What's SpongeBob's full name? SpongeBob SquarePants. Right. Good for you. Okay, one more. Who am I? I was born in a place called Palestine. My father was a carpenter. When I grew up, I traveled a lot. Early in my life, I visited Egypt with my parents. I was baptized when I was an adult. I love being with all different kinds of people. I was good at healing people. Okay, no guesses yet? Okay, here's one. Here's a good one. I surprised everybody when I came back to life. Who do you think that is? Do you know Grace? Jesus. Yes, Jesus. It's Jesus. Those are all the hints. Those are all things about Jesus. And, um, oh, by the way, who was Jesus? Do you know? 
We sing about him a lot in church. We talk about him a lot in church. Do you know some of the other things that Jesus was called? Some of the other names he was given? Well, maybe you folks can help out. Pardon? Carpenter. Carpenter. Son of God. Son of God. Jesus was called God's son. Savior. Savior is another name. Messiah. Messiah. Do you want to tell you, sometimes we say Jesus Christ, but Christ wasn't his last name. Christ is a describing word. Like, so sometimes we say he was Jesus, the Christ, which means God's son, and Messiah is another word for that. But that's, what other names do we have for Jesus? Emmanuel. Emmanuel? Yahweh, but is that a different uh, Yeah, well, Yahweh was used for God Yeah. yeah in the Hebrew tradition. Oh. Yeah. Sometimes people call him the light of the world. Sometimes people call him what some people call you, a good friend. Jesus said, I'll come to me. And as we come together, we have a name that's named after Jesus. Do you know what name that is? All of you have it. Christian. You know that Christian is just a form of Christ, Jesus the Christ, and we're all named after him as Christians. We're his followers. And today at church, we're going to be thinking about, um, about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and thinking about who Jesus is for us. Did you see that I brought some pictures? Who do you think that is? It is Jesus. And you know, you didn't mention the name he's called in this picture. The Good Shepherd. Sometimes people call him the Good Shepherd. There's Jesus the Carpenter. And I brought my favorite sketch of Jesus. This one. What's he doing? Laughing. Doesn't he look happy? This is called the Laughing Jesus. And a Canadian sketched this quite a long time ago. It's my favorite. So Jesus, like us, is, um, well, he, he was different things to different people at different times. And there were no cameras a long, long time ago when Jesus lived. But over time, people have painted pictures and made sculpts, sculptures and things that they think might have been what Jesus looked like. And they help us remember who he was. Let me say a prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for today. And that we can be here together to worship you. Thank you for Jesus. Who means so much to us. Help us to learn from him. And to follow him. We ask in his name. Amen. Okay. So. Eva and Beth and Diana are going to go downstairs with you because they've got some neat things planned for you for Sunday school. So have fun, okay?
story in the news this week, a story about the recovery of a stolen portrait of Winston Churchill. Did you hear about that? Yeah, of course. Figured you would. That uh, famous portrait, which is known as Roaring Lion, had been taken by famed Canadian <laughs> photographer Yusuf Karsh. And it hung in Ottawa's Chateau Laurier Hotel, where Karsh had his studio from 1972 to 92, and where he and his wife had lived for 18 years. You're probably familiar with Karsh and his work. He photographed some of the most famous people of the 20th century, and this particular portrait of then Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain, brought him Karsh, that is, the most fame. It was taken in 1941 in December, when Churchill came to Canada to address the Canadian Parliament at the height of the Second World War. And it was a stirring speech that the Prime Minister gave to our Parliament. This portrait, probably you've seen it if you're familiar with the story, shows a scowling Churchill with a hand on his hip. He still, um, there's a bit of a backstory to this that I learned. It was taken, this photograph, right after he had addressed Parliament, and he still had the papers from his speech clutched in his hand, and Karsh asked Churchill to put them in his pocket, which he did. And then, Karsh snatched the signature cigar right out of Winston Churchill's mouth, and would later say this, by the time I got back to my camera, he looked so belligerent he could have devoured me. And that's when the shot was taken. This notable historic portrait went missing during the Christmas season of 2021 and was discovered in Genoa, Italy, in the possession of a private citizen who had purchased it through an auction house, an art auction house in London, neither of whom knew that it was hot, that it was stolen goods. And just to bring the story around, a 43-year-old Powassan, Ontario person has been arrested and charged with the theft. And, happily, Roaring Lion is on its way back to the Chateau Hotel, uh, Chateau Laurier Hotel, to hang there once again in Ottawa. As I heard that story this week and as I was reflecting on the scriptures, it occurred to me that photographs and portraits can reveal quite a lot about an individual. And of course we know that different shots at different times from different angles can reveal different aspects of a person. Roaring Lion was one aspect of Sir Winston Churchill. As I acknowledged with the children I knew earlier, there were no photographs at the time Jesus lived, of course. And so we don't have any pictures of him per se. But we certainly have many portraits as works of art and works of imagination inspired by the stories of him from the Gospels and inspired by people's faith in him. I've brought just a few to display to get your thoughts moving this morning. Throughout history, in fact, many artists have um, sought to depict Jesus including Danish-born Canadian United Church minister Gregers Gregerson. His portrait, which he titled The Sixth Hour, is on our bulletin cover today. As you see, it depicts, depicts Jesus on the cross amidst his suffering at the sixth hour. And not right now, but if you haven't read it yet later, you can read the back of the bulletin to learn more about that. And keep in my eye. <laughs> I, uh, I brought two of my favorite portraits of Jesus this morning. One depicts Jesus the carpenter, a very human depiction of Jesus with rough hands carving a piece of wood. And the other is one in a series of four sketches, which was done by Canadian artist and United Church person Willis Wheatley back in 1973. There were four um, sketches. I've only brought the one today, which is one of my favorites. Wheatley called it Christ the Liberator, but of course it's most often referred to 
as the laughing Jesus. Wheatley, back in the 70s, challenged conventional characterizations of Jesus by portraying him in the throes of a big belly laugh. Like everyone else, Jesus had different sides to him, different sides to his personality, and he could be portrayed in a variety of ways as that tender shepherd there holding the little lamb, a very comforting image to many. Jesus is depicted differently depending on the context of the story which the artist is inspired by or by the artist's own perspective of who Jesus is. Like everyone else, Jesus was multifaceted. Jesus was a complex person and more. He was different things to different people at different times. Back in 2014, our United Church Observer magazine, now known as Broadview magazine, uh, had an article entitled The Many Faces of Jesus, which acknowledged art depictions of Jesus through time and how they revealed specific aspects of his life, his teaching, and his story. Which, of course, brings me to the Gospel reading today. At this point in the story that Mark is telling about Jesus of Nazareth, the disciples of Jesus and some other people had come to understand that Jesus was a, a teacher. They come to understand that he was a healer. He was given titles of rabbi, which of course in Hebrew means teacher. And he was given the title of healer. And even starting not long before this miracle worker. As he and his disciples traveled, traveled further afield, moving out into the villages and towns, people started talking about him. As Jesus was teaching about God and responding to people's situations of illness and disability, people started talking about this Jesus. Word started to spread about him. And on this day that Mark tells us about, Jesus and his disciples, having just left Bethsaida, where Jesus healed a man who had been blind, are on their way and near a town called Caesarea Philippi. And as they walk along the road, they're doing what many of us do when we walk along the trail. We talk with each other. We chit-chat. And then, out of the blue, Jesus puts a question to them. Who do people say that I am? He's asking, like, what are people saying about me? What have you heard? And they report various things that people are saying, and they reply with three different identities that's being speculated about. Some are saying, well, he's kind of like John the Baptist, his cousin. And some others are saying, you know, way back when Elijah, the great prophet, was whisked up to heaven and disappeared, maybe he's Elijah, come back to earth. And still others are saying, well, I think this is a great prophet. I don't know if it's one come back or if it's a new one. And Jesus listens, and then he moves from that general question about what people have been saying about him and who he is to a more um, pointed, critical, personal question. He says, but who do you say that I am? What do you say about me? What do you believe? Who do you say that I am? And Peter makes that great confession of faith. He says he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. It's the first time in Mark's Gospel that this word is used for Jesus. It's the first time that this identity is revealed. This passage from Mark has been described by biblical scholars as scandalous. You didn't look too scandalized when Debbie were read it this morning. But here's why biblical scholars say that this story is somewhat scandalous. It's scandalous to think that the long-awaited Messiah in Judaism could be a Palestinian Jew of little wealth, power, or <coughs> regard. And particularly because Peter likely has in mind, as Messiah, a political liberator who would free Israel from tyranny. But as soon as Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah, as soon as he says this, what does Jesus say? He says, don't, don't tell anybody. 
Don't say that. And then he goes on to describe the suffering that's going to happen to the Son of Man, another title which Jesus used for himself, a title that comes out of the scriptures. And in this way, Jesus totally upended the title of Messiah in a way which Peter and the other disciples could never have imagined. It's revealed that there are clear clash here, or a conflict between ideas of what that means to be the Messiah. In Peter's way of understanding, and what Jesus calls his humanly shaped understanding, his concept of the Messiah is that suffering is to be conquered rather than embraced. But according to divine way of thinking, says Jesus, suffering and death are necessary to being God's anointed. It seems that Peter might have gotten the answer right, the right title, but he had the wrong understanding of what Messiah is. The Messiah who is Jesus is not a conquering by might liberator, but a suffering with the people kind of Messiah. Martha Moore Keish in the biblical commentary, feasting on the word, suggests that, and I quote, what Jesus seems to be indicating is that as the Messiah, God incarnate, he needs to endure the depth of human pain and must bear the fullness of the human experience in order to bring humanity into communion with God. Unquote. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. And he doesn't just ask the disciples that question. He asks it again today. To you and me. Who do you say? that Jesus is today in 2024. Who is Jesus for you? Who is Jesus to you? What do you believe about him? What title or name or descriptor is most meaningful and most comfortable <coughs> for you? And that question, the last one, is not rhetorical. Tell me, when you think of Jesus, what are the, what's the title that you most often think of, or the way you most often think of him? The word. Right. Friend. Savior. 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 Comforter. Comforter. Teacher. Teacher. There are so many, aren't there? Mm -hmm. So many titles, so many words, so many descriptors. And how you answer that question for yourself implies much about your relationship with him and to him. Is he Lord? Is he Savior? Friend? Master? Teacher? Prophet? Messiah? Son of God? Revolutionary? Good Shepherd? Redeemer? He is this and so much more. But who is he to you? A song of faith, which is the most recent um, statement of faith affirmed by our church, by the General Council of the United Church of Canada, back in 2006, has this to say as a contemporary statement about what we believe and how we understand this Jesus of Nazareth. And I quote, we sing of Jesus, a Jew, born to a woman in poverty, in a time of social upheaval and political oppression. He knew human joy and sorrow. So filled with the Holy Spirit was he, that in him people experienced the presence of God among them. We sing praise to God incarnate. Jesus announced the coming of God's reign, a commonwealth of, not of domination, but of peace, justice, and reconciliation. He healed the sick and fed the hungry. He forgave sins and freed those held captive by all manner of demonic powers. He crossed barriers of race, class, culture, and gender. He preached and practiced unconditional love. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of friend, love of enemy. And he commanded his followers to love one another as he had loved them. Because his witness to love was threatening, those exercising power sought to silence Jesus. He suffered abandonment and betrayal. 
state-sanctioned torture and execution. He was crucified. But death was not the last word. God raised Jesus from death, turning sorrow into joy, despair into hope. We sing of Jesus raised from the dead. We sing, how will you? By becoming flesh in Jesus, God makes all things new. In Jesus' life, teaching, and self-offering, God empowers us to live in love. In Jesus' crucifixion, God bears the sin, grief, and suffering of the world. In Jesus' resurrection, God overcomes death. Nothing separates us from the love of God. The risen Christ lives today, present to us and the source of our hope. In response to who Jesus was and to all he did and taught, to his life, death, and resurrection, and his continuing presence with us through the Spirit, we celebrate him as the Word made flesh. The one in whom God and humanity are perfectly joined. The transformation of our lives, the Christ. And we sing of a church seeking to continue the story of Jesus by embodying Christ's presence in the world. We are called together by Christ as a community of broken but hopeful believers, loving what he loved, living what he taught, striving to be faithful servants of God in our time and place. This is who Jesus is for us today. We profess him by many names. The one who is the Messiah, Christ, human and divine, who both laughs and suffers, and who shows us the depth of God's unconditional love and God's desire for justice and right relationship among all peoples of this world. And yes, we bear his name too. As Christians, may we continue to faithfully embody the presence of Jesus in the world, in our day, in our place. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue this reflection on who Jesus is in the words of this hymn, You, Lord, are both Lamb and Shepherd. Words of Sylvia Dunstan, page or number 210 in Voices United. And as we sing, I invite to ensure that our offerings are brought forward.
that this past week our, our session, our elders met as a combined pastoral charge. And one of the things I always invite the elders to respond to is feedback on worship and to help direct our worship. It's their job as well as mine. And one of the things that was decided and noted this week is that our offering plates will continue to be at the entrance to the sanctuary and not pass from person to person as COVID is still um, around. But it was their request that it would be good to go back to having a prayer of dedication. So let us pray. Gracious God, as Jesus honored you and served his sisters and brothers with the gifts of his life and his love, so we as Christian people also honor you. And we serve our sisters and brothers with the gifts of our lives and with the love of our hearts as expressed by the offerings we make today. Bless our gifts, O God, to support the ministry of Christ through our local churches and through mission and service and through the work of the Picto West Food Bank. Bless the giving and all the gifts in Jesus' name. The information today is entitled A Journey of Faith and Peace. Sophie Fitzgerald was one of two United Church young adults selected to attend the Minority Youth Forum in Japan, hosted by the Center of Minority Issues and Mission. Sophie writes about her experience. As a young woman in my 20s who has lived and grown up in the United Church, I have always felt God's call to spread God's love and peace in any way that I can. Being involved with many organizations and missions with the church, I've had the privilege to do this many times in many provinces across Canada, but never internationally. Until this past March, where God called me to travel to Maya Shojima Island, on a tour of the island, we saw exactly what the Japanese military is doing to Maya Jima. We saw how they are taking the beautiful beaches and using them as training camps, putting up missile bunkers in the middle of the town next to people's homes and so much more. We sat and talked about how our generation can help the people of Maya Jima have peace once again and how peace cannot be created with military and military weapons. Throughout these conversations and visits to these sites, you could feel an overwhelming presence of our Creator, and was sad when coming to the terms that everything beautiful that God created was being destroyed and will be destroyed if war does occur. We all need to come together to be a community, a community of God's children striving to seek peace in the world. All people of compassion, wisdom, and belief need to come together in order to take care of one another and to take care of our beautiful world that the Creator made. Systems of injustice can only be resolved with community and partnership with one another. I am blessed that I Get to bring the partnership and the stories of the people of Myojima Island back to my island of Newfoundland. The Youth Forum, Forum is an ecumenical initiative of churches in Japan, supported by the United Church of Canada and Mission and Service. Your generosity through Mission and Service helps programs like this, one that inspires peace and learning. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. I learned yesterday of the death of a member of our United Church of Canada who has made monumental contributions to our church and has left a great legacy within our church and beyond it. And I want to share with you before our prayer a portion of the statement that was issued by our denomination yesterday. With great sadness, the United Church of Canada announces the death of the very Reverend, the Honorable Dr. Lois M. Wilson, the denomination's 28th moderator and the first woman to fill the role. She faithfully served as moderator from 1980 to 1982. 
Reverend Wilson died in hospital in Fredericton, New Brunswick on September the 13th, 2024, at the age of 97. Her faith drove her actions and she remained involved in the work of the church right to the end. Wilson's legacy is one of many firsts. The first woman president of the Canadian Council of Churches. Elected the first woman moderator of the United Church, paving the way for many progressive developments in the church. The first Canadian to serve as a president of the World Council of Churches. In 2000, she led Canada's first parliamentary delegation to North Korea to begin the process of establishing formal diplomatic relations. And she was appointed to the Senate in 1998, retiring in 2002. There's more to that statement, but if you would like to read it, you can find it online on the United Church of Canada website. And so as we join in prayer this morning, it is also a time for us to give thanks, to thank God for the life and witness of Lois Wilson. Let us pray. Holy One, as disciples of Jesus, we've come out to this time of worship today. And we pause, we pause to pray, holding in our hearts gratitude for your goodness and for all of our life's blessings, and holding into the light of your presence the struggles of this world and the needs of our lives. We say thank you, God, for your loving kindness toward us, for the earth and its abundance given in trust, for these glorious September days of sunshine, for the health and strength which allows us to actively support the mission you've called us to share through your church. And we thank you for the people with whom we share the journey of our lives, in families, communities, in our congregations and pastoral charge, in our places of work, and for many, our classrooms. Today we give thanks with these offerings of thanks for the life of Lois Wilson and the tremendous contribution she's made to our United Church of Canada through the years. Her ministry, her courage, her tireless activism for justice changed our United Church and indeed changed Canada and the world. May the story of her witness of faith continue to be told and may it be a source of inspiration and guidance in the transforming work you call us to share as Christian people. And may she now rest in peace in the mystery that is life in your deeper presence. We thank you too this morning for Jesus the Christ and for his revelation of truth given in love. We're grateful for all he means to us, for the relationship we share with him, for his gospel that cracks open your realm right here and now in our world, and for his risen presence with us. We're grateful, O oh God, that your presence and grace revealed in worship, but also whenever a caring word is spoken, wherever a loving act is performed, however a work of justice is fulfilled, continues that work of Jesus. Grant us, we pray, a courage to be faithful to Christ's way and a commitment to live out our relationship with him, which will have a direct bearing on the decisions and thoughts and actions and grant us a love that merits being called Christian. And we join to pray together now that your comforting word will be heard by all who grieve and are troubled, that your challenging word will be heard by all who are unmoved or apathetic, that your guiding word will be heard by all who feel lost, that your empowering word will be heard by those needing strength for the challenge of this day. We pray that your reconciling word will be heard by all who are at odds with others, and that your healing and sustaining word will be heard by all who are sick and who struggle with illness of body, mind, or spirit, and we continually uphold into the light of your love, Barb Richardson. Enable us, O oh God, to take our faith to heart, to follow Christ with devotion, and to trust that his love and ours make a difference in this world that you so love. We join these prayers by speaking together the prayer Jesus taught his followers long ago. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. We sing number 344 again in Voices United. Christ who serves with wounded hands teach you to serve each other. And may the Christ who loves with a wounded heart help you to love each other. When you go out, may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. And now go with God's blessing, with Christ's love to share, and with peace that is a gift of the Spirit to sustain you every day. Thank mm -hmm. you.